To start this video, I want to review how we think about typical kinetic measurements of a chemical reaction or some chemical process. And the idea there is very simple. We start with some concentration of, let's say, a reactant in a chemical reaction, R. And we follow that concentration of R, or some variable that stands in for that concentration, such as the absorbance of R at a particular wavelength, we follow that as a function of time. And the kinetic data we obtain typically starts at some high initial concentration of R and falls off over time, perhaps in an inverse exponential way with time if we're looking at a first order process, for example, and this is our kinetic data. We'd like to do the same for behavior and processes of excited states. The complicated thing here is generating the excited state in a high enough initial concentration to actually be detectable and followable over time. It wasn't really until the 1940s that we had the ability to generate excited states in high enough concentration at a rapid enough time scale that we could then follow a process of the excited state over time without problematic convolution of the generation of the excited state and its consumption happening at the same time. And the way we were able to finally surmount this obstacle was through the development of an innovation called flash photolysis, which is the subject of this video. And the name is a little bit misleading. Flash indicates that this is a very rapid generation of a large number of excited state molecules through a very rapid flash of light. And photolysis seems to suggest that a bond is breaking. That's not always the case. In essence, we're looking at decay processes of the excited state, usually by following something like emission or absorption over time. Ever since the development of flash photolysis, innovations have centered on shortening the amount of time required to generate a large concentration of excited state, primarily using lasers, and decreasing the time resolution as we measure after the generation of the excited state in our kinetic data, and essentially getting time points that are closer together after the generation of the excited state. Flash photolysis is what we call a pump probe technique, and pump and probe refer to two different uses of light in the flash photolysis experiment. In the pump phase, we use a very short-lived and very strong, very high-intensity light wave, typically a laser pulse, to produce a very large concentration of excited state molecules. In the probe phase, we use a different light wave potentially to engage in spectroscopic analysis. And we may not use any light at all in the probe phase, looking at emission, for example, or we may use a probe pulse of light to look for absorption of the excited state in a transient absorption spectroscopy experiment, for example. A typical setup for a flash photolysis experiment is shown in this diagram. And here we're using both pump light and probe light to do an absorption experiment. So I want to start by drawing your attention to this xenon flash lamp, which is the excitation source. This is a very bright flash of light that includes the wavelength of light that excites the sample. This produces a high concentration of excited state molecules inside our sample chamber, and we might call that M star zero, since this is our initial concentration of excited state molecules. The perpendicular setup here, this LED source on the left, is our probe light. And the idea here is that this is essentially an absorption experiment. We're taking an absorption spectrum of the excited states generated via the flash pulse. And the amount of light transmitted through the sample is detected here. And of course, the digitizer puts it all into digital form and sends it to the computer. We can then look at the wavelength of light picked out by this filter, the absorption of that wavelength as a function of time, and we'll get exactly the typical kind of kinetic data we're used to with one little wrinkle that we'll address here shortly. Naively, this is going to look like typical kinetic data with, in this case, the absorbance at our wavelength of interest, which is basically a stand-in for this molarity as a function of time, and we imagine it's going to decrease over time. And of course, the time resolution of this curve all depends on the kinetics of our photodiode, you know, how quickly it can make measurements and all that good stuff. 
In fact, the data doesn't look quite like this exponential decay when we're doing a flash photolysis experiment because there is a very brief phase where the pump pulse is exciting the sample and the intensity of, say, light fluoresce or the absorbance is increasing as a result of the increasing concentration of the excited state molecules. However, if we know the line shape of the pump pulse, which is very common, right, that's built into the instrument, we know the characteristics of this xenon flash lamp, for example, in, in detail, we can account for this initial increase in the concentration of excited state and then include that in our fit of this data and then include an exponential decay term in the fit as well to measure the process that is consuming the excited state. So typically with the probe curve, in order to fit this and understand the kinetics of what is getting rid of the excited state, we use a fit that includes the pump increase in concentration and the decay of the signal due to decay of the excited state. So what we can get from this then are measurements of the lifetime, tau, of the excited state by looking, for example, at the decay constant of the exponential decay going on in this probe data. One thing to be aware of in flash photolysis experiments is that multiple decay processes can take place. You may not see, for example, a nice single exponential decay. You may have what's called a multiple exponential or multi-exponential decay if multiple processes with different rate constants are consuming the excited state. For example, if intersystem crossing and phosphorescence are competitive with fluorescence, you may see a loss of signal that is more rapid than just the single exponential fluorescence decay you'd expect in the absence of intersystem crossing. That's going to depend on the particular system, but it's something to watch out for when you're fitting flash photolysis data. And more generally, any kinetic data in a photochemical context, these multi-exponential fits are very common as a result of the multiple decay processes available to many excited states. So typical flash photolysis data may look like something like this, like you see in the large graph right here. We've got time on the x-axis, relative intensity at 450 nanometers on the y-axis, fluorescence intensity in this case. And here we're looking at the loss in fluorescence intensity of singlet excited acetone as a function of different concentrations of a quencher which in this case is this tributyl 10 hydride molecule. And you can see from the curve that as the concentration of quencher increases, decay happens more quickly, and as a consequence, the fluorescence lifetime of the acetone decreases. So each of these curves, in a simple case, relatively simple case like this, can be modeled by an exponential decay function, e to the negative kt is equal to the intensity, and of course, the faster decay just indicates that the rate constant increases. So K1 at 3.5 molar is the largest rate constant, K2 is a little bit smaller, K3 is a little bit smaller than that, and K4 with no quencher is the smallest rate constant. And so just by fitting this data to a simple inverse exponential function, we can get a measure of the lifetime. And by the way, the lifetime is simply the inverse of the rate constant. Notice that rate constant units for unimolecular processes or things we're thinking of as unimolecular at constant quencher concentration. Say we have a very high concentration of the quencher relative to the excited state, which is normal. The rate constant we can think of as having inverse second units, and that's equal to one over the lifetime, which has units of seconds. And so we can measure lifetimes using flash photolysis as well as rate constants of photochemical reactions or other processes such as fluorescence. And in the grand scheme of things, flash photolysis is a very intuitive way to co collect kinetic data on photochemical processes because we are, just like in any kinetic experiment, starting with a large initial concentration of our reactant, the excited state, and following its disappearance over time. In the next video, we're going to look at a different approach to obtain the same kind of data intensity as a function of time using a very different approach that focuses on single molecules and single photons.